good evening again to all of you who are joining with us for our 10th session in our study series. It's certainly been a joy of mine to be engaging you and to be sharing with you. I appreciate the comments that you have made and I'm thankful that I can help clarify some things for you that may have previously been difficult to understand. I hope as we continue to go through our sessions, you will get more enlightenment and we come to understand what God wants us to understand from the word and make the applications for our personal lives in the way that the, the study of the word will benefit us. So that it's not a matter of getting head knowledge, but also understanding what God will have for us and what adjustments we will have to make into our belief systems or practices that we would be more in accordance with the word of God and not just with the traditions of me. I would want to recommend that if you have questions to ask that you try as much as possible to get close to your device because sometimes it's a little difficult um, for me hearing the question because the volume seems to be rather low and that's why sometimes they have to make reference to voice to um, try to interpret the question for me. So if you are too distant from, from your device, I would recommend that you try to be as close as possible so that the sound can come through uh, carefully. What I want to, to do tonight again is to begin to recap of some of the important things that we have discussed from the last session, because as I indicated, it's necessary for us to do that because a lot of concepts are new and understandings and interpretations are unfamiliar to some people who will not perhaps have been dealing with topics like these in any um, significant measure. So I think it's important we keep doing the recapitulation so that um, if you miss anything from the last session or something was not really, really clear, you get a better understanding before we proceed. And if perhaps your, your memory might be jarred by something that you did not understand or you may have wanted to ask a question, you didn't get a chance, it would give you the opportunity to be able to do that. So in our last session, we, we looked at the, the third um, interpretation of Revelation chapter 13. And we also made comparisons from Revelation chapter 12 and chapter 17. We recognize that we have three main interpretations of this concept of the beast. One position is the position that it represents character of the past, Nero. Another perspective is that it represents the character of the future, referred as the Antichrist, who we are still expecting to come. And then there was the third perspective, which in, in a sense is part past and still in a way part present. And that position that we were examining was the perspective that the beast represented the paper system, which would have been given the power by the Roman Empire. So we looked at the characteristics of the beast from Revelation chapter 13, and we sought to see how we could identify in terms of the characteristics identified, how we could associate the Pope and the papacy with what was shown to us from the revelation of John in chapter 13. So we examined the characteristics that we, we saw and we saw how appropriate it would have been in terms of the, the papacy and the system which is managed and head, headed by the court. So we were not looking just at an individual person, 
that we were looking at the papacy as a whole and what represented for that system. The head, obviously, of that system would be the Pope, but it would be a variety of Popes who would have been in position of leadership over time. Reverend Jackman, I think you're muted. Are you hearing me now? Yes, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, well, that, that, that seemed to have done that on its own because I didn't touch anything. Right, so you said that it was the universal system as well, so that the papacy had ruled over language and nations. And so it represented universal power. We also recognize that Revelation indicated to us that the beast spoke the names of blasphemy and we look to see how that would have applied to the Pope. And we say that the Popes identify themselves with the Vicar of the Son of God. And they also spoke as having authority to forgive sin. That's where we still even have confessions being made to the Pope on that system. The revelation indicated that the reign would have lasted for about 1260 years prophetically. When we examined that historically, we saw that the papal system came into being from about 538 AD and came to an end in 1798, which would actually work out to exactly 1260 years. We saw a characteristic identified as having a number to his name, a scribe, 666. And when we examine the Roman numerals to the inscription that the Pope carries on his mitre, that's the Vicar of the Son of God, that's the title that was given to the Pope. Recognize that aligning the Roman numerals with letters that made up that Latin inscription he came up with the exact number of 666. While that was the case, the thought was that it may not necessarily mean that that's a number that would be ascribed literally to the person and that the people who come under his domain and his power will have to carry that mark on their forehead or on their hands as the vision identifies but it could be symbolic because we established the fact that we're dealing with a very symbolic book. And so a lot of the references that are made have a lot of symbolism attached to them and it need not be interpreted literally. Premillennialists believe in the literal interpretation of a lot of prophetic uh, scripture, including Book of Revelation. And that's why they have identified a number of things in, in a literal sense. But we recognize that we have to be careful, careful of that particular perspective because there are a lot of symbols used in Revelation. And if we do not attach sometimes the spiritual or symbolic recommendation instead of a literal interpretation, you would have difficulty in coming up with the correct interpretation of, of the scripture. So we have to be very wary of that and recognize that taking a mark and not necessarily mean taking a mark because we have had references to Christians having a mark or a seal 
and it was never intended to be a little remark. And we know that it's not a little remark. Even in Revelation, it talk, Revelation it talks about um, people having the mark of God spread to them. And it's not a little remark. We recognize that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. We carry the mark of identification by our lifestyle. And the fourth was symbolic of what our thought processes are, our belief system, and the mark on the hand to be representative of our actions, things that we do. So we can identify with the mark of, of Christ through his power controlling our thoughts on, on our lives. Or we can identify with the beast, the control by a world system that makes us act contrary to God's divine will and purpose for us. Because in Revelation, we recognize that those people who don't take the mark are the ones who are going to reign with Christ. And we are reigning with Christ already in this world. We accept him as Lord and Savior and do not allow the world system to control and conduct our behaviors and patterns. I wanted to mention to you the comparison from Daniel chapter 7, because we, we also studied Daniel chapter 7, and we, we recognize that, that there's, a, there's a, um, a sort of synergy between the vision that Daniel had and, and what John had in, in similar ways. And so in, in Daniel chapter 7, there is mention of a little horn, which comes up out of the the 10 horns that were identified. And we did indicate that the seven head and the 10 horns are representative of the Roman Empire. So we have the same symbol used in Daniel. We have a similar symbols used in Revelation. So we know that we are dealing with the same entity. And Daniel 7, which we didn't go through specifically, but which you were assigned to, to, to read, and I hope you would have read it, and you would have made some reference to it already. I want to specifically make mention of the little horn because the little horn compares with the beast in Revelation. And as a matter of fact, even the premillennialists recognize that, that there is a comparison between the little horn and the beast. And they see the little horn as representative of the Antichrist in the same way that they see the beast as representative of the Antichrist. So the persons who would associate the symbols if the papacy and the Pope and see the little horn as representative of the, of the Pope and the papal system, as well as the beast in Revelation, because they carry similar characteristics. So I will just mention the, the characteristics here identified from the little horn so that we can see how it will compare with what John saw in Revelation 13. He said that he had eyes and most speaking great things. That will compare with the blasphemy that was spoken about in, in Revelation. He speaks against the most high. He arises after the fourth kingdom, of, of, as a matter of fact, out of that ten kingdom. And it says that he was different from the other horns. Because in the Roman Empire, the ten kingdoms would, would be classified as imperial or political leaders. Whereas this little horn, which is supposed to be different, will be identified as a religious or ecclesiastical. So he's different. So he's a ruler coming out of the Roman Empire system, but he's different in that his power is not really um, imperial or political. It's more of ecclesiastical nature. It, it is a leader rising through the church of Rome, which we often refer to as Roman Catholicism. It also mentions he persecutes the saints. So this is the same thing that the beast in Revelation did. Another characteristic is that he intends to alter times and laws. You didn't see that mentioned in the one in Revelation. But that is another characteristic that would be applicable to what the popes were able to do. Because we have Pope Gregory, who would have made adjustment to, to times in that he would have changed the calendar from the Julian calendar to the Gregorian calendar, which we still um, operate by today. So that 
lessons to be a changing of time. And then there were, there were changes in the, in the laws governing the, the, the communal worship in the Roman Empire, which was introduced by Constantine and accepted in the papal system, where the communal worship day, which was in the Jewish tradition on the Sabbath, and I'm not here now making a, a push for Sabbath over Sunday. I'm just showing you how the application um, is made looking at the characteristics identified in the two visions, the one that Daniel saw, the one that John saw. And, and in fact, we can make the application in that that was a law which was changed and it came to Roman Catholicism. And, and Sunday then being identified as the common day of, of worship rather than the Sabbath. And some people will say that Sunday worship there was, was introduced by a pagan system. But we, we, we must bear in mind that the Jews still met on Sundays, we have, we have seen in the, in the New Testament. But the Sabbath was still the established day of worship. But Constantine, in conjunction with, with the Roman um, system and the Roman Catholic Church, will establish Sunday as the day of worship, the main day of worship for the empire, and that's the system which we still tend to operate on the day. You know, Sunday is, is the main day identified uh, for communal worship. And then it also said that the saints were given into the, the authority and the power of this little horn for a time, times, and a dividing of time which we said prophetically mean three and a half years, which would be equivalent of the same 1260 days. So these are the characteristics then that would be identified, the little horn and the beast, associated with the, the, the pagan Roman Empire, persecuting the Christians, changing times and laws, speaking words of blasphemy. And so we can, we can see how these can apply to the papacy because these characteristics were born out in, in the papacy. We also look at the, the, the woman from Revelation 12 and 17. And we say one of the interpretations given was that it represented the, the Jews. And the interpretation that our theologians are, are mostly inclined to support is that it was representation of the church in chapter 12. It would be the church in its first time glory. That's the beginning church identified in the book of Acts and identifying those first time characteristics. But over time, that first time church became an apostate church because it was introduced into apostasy through the Roman Catholic system and it became the, the harlot riding on the beast. And compared to Mystery Babylon, which John said was, is, and is to come, we recognize that that has application again for the Roman Catholic system because it introduced into the church practices and customs and traditions that were associated with pagan Babylon system. So, yes, Babylon was a real city that existed. So, that was the past. It had its own culture and it had its own practices but some of these were introduced into the roman system which they were which they adopted and then they were transferred to the roman catholic church which then became a future experience so it was it then existed in john's time in the roman empire with some of the same pagan practices from babylon coming through into the roman empire and then when the power was transferred to the ecclesiastical power of, of the papacy, some of these same um, practices were maintained in, in the ecclesiastical system through the papacy because the aim of Constantine was to create harmony in his empire. There were pagan practices, but Christianity had become a dominant religion, and that would be part of the Roman Empire. Constantine being the wise politician he was, 
he wanted to make sure he had a harmony. And a good way of doing that was to be able to merge the practices of paganism with those of Christianity, because he himself practiced paganism, even though he claimed to have been a Christian and gave support to Christianity and allowed them you know, to function um, in, in his system, not, not being persecuted as they previously were. But what he recommended is that they make adjustments and where they can appropriate some of the pagan practices to their own religious systems that they do that so that they encourage pagans to become um, adjusted to the, to the Christian form and it'll be a means of, of expanding um, their, their membership as a result of allowing pagans to be still able to, to, to function in harmony with their, their, their Christian beliefs. And that's where a significant problem arose. And that's why even today, we are still experiencing some of these practices within the church. And it was a question that was asked, um, can we identify these practices still prevalent in the church? So that's what we began to look at at the end of that session. So I hope you are clear so far on the position, the third position, because we look at all three positions in relation to the interpretation of the beast in Revelation. And I indicated to you that our theologians are more inclined to associate themselves with the, with the third perspective, that is seeing the beast as a representative of the pagan um, papal system, which we're living into an apostate state or a fallen away from the original Christian beliefs and practices. And that's why it was described as the harlot woman being compared to Israel when they also went away from God and engaged in, in pagan worship, which was introduced to them as well through Babylon and through Egypt. And they were described also as an adulterous woman which would be comparing with the, the Roman Catholic Church, they compared with that harlot woman because she moved away, adjusting to what Constantine would have wanted. She adjusted to the pagan practices and found herself moving away from the early pristine glory that was established in the church, which was that woman described in Revelation 12, as the woman with, with 12 stars uh, found on her head, represented the beginning church, which was persecuted by the dragon. And we recognize that that was an illustration of the Roman Empire under the influence of Satan because he was identified as the dragon in Revelation 12. And the woman went into the wilderness and she was there preserved and kept by God. That's the symbolism in the description for the same 1260 years. So we see the harmony coming back and we can understand the appropriateness of that because during that, that period that we identified as the, the, the papal rule, the church was under tremendous pressure. That is the, the, the Christian church that was subject to the original doctrine and teaching of the early church because the Catholic rule is the, the world at that time, they control the, 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 the religious system and they inflicted even serious persecution on the Christians in their time and a lot of them were martyred as a result. So that was also the interpretation that was made by the early reformers like Martin Luther and Calvin and Wycliffe and, and those early reformers so our theologians were inclined to share a similar interpretation. So, so the Church of God Reformation movement would be inclined to support the theological perspective that Revelation is not to be taken literally as a symbolic book. The application that we made is that those symbols identified by the beast and the little horn are appropriately connected to the establishment of the papacy religious 
system governed and controlled by the court because we can see how it can apply. Remember, I indicated to you that these are symbols. And in no part of Revelation do we give, do we have a specific identification of, of, of the symbols. We are just interpreting what they mean. So we are open to other views and other interpretations, and we cannot come up and say um, emphatically that they are wrong. Because the people who believe that the beast represented Nero have very strong argument for it and can apply the symbols. The people who believe that the beast represents the Antichrist who is to come in the future have also uh, appropriate uh, application to the symbolism. But as I indicated, that would be for the future. So we cannot um, actually apply anything. We would have to wait for things to unfold to know if that interpretation is true. But for the ones who believe it was the past and refer to Nero, you have the, the specific application that can be made from the history. For those who will support the fact that they represent the papacy, again, you have historical uh, references and you have specific ways, which I have shown you some of them that we can apply to show how it could indeed have been a prophecy related to the papacy. Generally speaking, we believe that the book of Revelation is not all about the past, not all about the future. Our position is that it's a, it's a, it's a revelation which gives the history of the church. Uh, from its beginning stage, that's from the Christian woman in chapter 12, right down to the coming of, of Christ. And so it gives events, um, a synopsis of things that the church will, will, will show. We have always been going through persecution, and persecution will continue. The devil has always been fueling um, systems, political and religious, to destroy the church. But revelation indicate in the overall um, analysis that the church is going to be triumphant and the kingdom of God is going to last forever. And that's what Daniel also saw. He saw in his vision a little stone that was filled with hands that came up at the same time the Roman Empire was in power. And it struck that image and that little stone became a great mountain and spread over the world. And that symbolically was representing the church, so we can see how symbols can have the application and that they can be accurate. And so the church became a, a, a world kingdom, spiritual kingdom. And as I said, that is what we, we, we have to discuss because there are different interpretations in relation to that whole aspect of the kingdom. If it has already been a reality or if it's come in the future, and that's going to be a very important topic which we are going to um, be engaged in. In, in our next course of study, but I want to finish off tonight. And if we don't have a lot of discussion or questions um, in relation to these particular areas, we can actually commence a look at the study of, of the kingdom of God, because that is a very um, important issue in relation to end time events. So we look then at the practices that are still part of the church. Most of them tend to identify with Roman Catholicism because that's where a lot of the adjustment took place in, in, the, in the early stages of transfer of power from the Roman imperial system to the papal system. And that's why we see most of the, of the traditions and the practices are still system in the Roman Catholic system. You will see some of them, yes, that we will look at tonight, that will also apply to the Protestants and even evangelical churches. Because remember, the, the Roman Catholic system had universal power and authority, and it still has significant influences on other forms of, of, of religious um, practices. And so some of them are still incorporated um, in the system outside of the Roman Catholic Church. We mentioned transubstantiation, which is one of the, of the main um, concepts and beliefs of, of the Roman Catholics, in that when they conduct the Holy Eucharist, they believe that through the prayer of the Pope, 
that the, the wafer that you use and the wine that you use are, are really transformed into the body and the blood of Christ. And, and we did recognize that that had its origin in, in pagan um, occult worship, where they believed that they, they could connect and share in the, in the body of their pagan deities, but again, having the same symbolism that the meat they use and the wine they drink, they drink became the actual body and blood of their pagan deities, so that that's how they would be able to connect with them in an intimate way. And that belief system, even though it, it had pagan origins, origins and roots, was incorporated into the Roman Catholic system. And they argue, you see, that's why it's very important that people understand when there is symbolism, when there's figurative language used, and, 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 and don't be carried away that we then come up with the wrong interpretation. Because what they argue is that Jesus said that he is the bread of life. And you can eat, and you can feed on him. You also look at the, the woman at the well, the water that she, she drank. Was, uh, in, in essence, what the Bible is indicating is spiritual, but they, they have taken things that are literal. And so when Jesus was having the communion with his disciples, they took the bread and, and the, the grape juice. As Jesus was saying, this is my body, eat of it. They are taking that literally, but it is symbolic. It's just like when Nicodemus went to Jesus and asked, um, Jesus told him that he must be born again. Nicodemus wanted to find out if you can enter your mother's womb and, and, and be born again. He was taking it literally. Obviously, Jesus did not mean that. So, so the Catholics will justify um, their position because they are taking things that, that Jesus said in a figurative way, literally. But the reality is that it is still based on a teaching and a, and a belief system that came from the Babylonian system, right, right through now even into the Catholic system. Uh, Rev? Yes. Right. I believe uh, Pastor Ralph has a question or a comment. So, yes. Um, um, Pastor Ralph? Yes, Ralph, don't forget to unmute your phone. Uh, are you are you hearing us, Ralph? Okay. Yes. Yeah, you can hear me now. Yes, we're hearing you. Yes, now. yes. All right. Good night, Reverend Jackman. Um, my question Good night comes. To you. From, my question comes from Revelation chapter seventeen. Um, yes. Does those verses refer to the papacy or? Um, the kingdoms at, at that time that had fallen. What what part of seventeen? What 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 part of seventeen you you're dealing with? Are you seventeen a specific part? Or are you dealing with the whole chapter? Verses, verses ten to twelve. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. When he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and, and is not even, he is the eighth, and is of the seventh and was into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings, one hour with the beast. That goes are the verse you refer to. Yes. Right, are you asking if uh, what they refer to the do they refer to Kingdoms that had fought, fallen, and also the papacy. Well, the, the, the persons who interpret Revelation to be a, a, um, a record of a past event would interpret that particular section. To me, is referring to emperors 
I already passed or I already done it. Yeah. Okay. And, I, and I, the one is is the one that is presently ruling, and then there's one that is to come. And when he comes, he will last for a short time. Okay. And and in actual fact, the one that was that, that said is to come, he only lasted for about six months. The one that they claimed that was was present was was Claudius, and then he goes. Nero is the one that is going to follow him, and that's how they interpret that. That um, if he passes the second Thessalonians was indicating that what was keeping that man of sin, that son of perdition, from being revealed was the one that was currently in power, which they will say was Claudius Caesar, and after he goes. Nero will come, and then Nero will pass, and, and one will come after him, and will last for a short time. That's how they interpret it. So they were saying, they were saying then that the, the, the person who is restraining the revelation of this individual is going to be there until he's moved out of the way. you see, they saw Nero as a representation of the of the beast, because as a matter of fact, that was a title that he was actually given. So that's how they interpreted that. Now, we now who believe that it's referring to the papacy don't see it that way. We are seeing it as, as specific um, systems of, of, of Roman um, management and practice. And when those systems fall and they're out of the way, then the revelation of the, the, the papacy is going to come, which means that according to what Paul said in Thessalonians, because Paul also had a glimpse of, of this individual that we are interpreting either as the Antichrist or as the papacy or as Nero, because there are three different positions. We say that, and Paul said, he who no letteth be let on until he be taken out of the way. What Paul is saying is that the, 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 the system that is now in operation is preventing or hindering the revelation of the papacy because Pope Rome is still in power, but when, when Rome is broken down, you know, Rome the system collapsed in I think it was 84 76. But when that system is out of the way, then the papacy will take over in, in leading the, the, the empire in an ecclesiastical way. So that is how um, that is in, in, interpreted. So you see, this what I was saying is that it, it is difficult. To, to say that this person is wrong and we are right because you don't have a specific um, illustration. It is just symbols that you have to interpret and people will come up with different interpretations which would sound reasonable and sensible. But I say at the end of the day, all of them can't be right. But those are the different applications you get to that. So, so that would be referring really to the, the Roman Empire and the system and how it would manage and the the, the emperors that ruled, the ones that had passed, the one that was present, and the one that is to come. That is what I was referring to if you're looking at it in a past sense. If yeah. you're looking at it from um, our interpretive perspective, then it is, yes, the Roman power is in place. But when that system um, comes to an end and the Roman empire collapses, the papacy is going to, to rule, but yeah. not basically in a political way, in an in ecclesiastical way, and that is what is going to be represented here. So the ten horns and the and ten kings, that has always been a symbol of the Roman Empire, but that will that will move, that will collapse. So, so Rome, even though it was one of the most powerful of those kingdoms after Babylon, it was still destined to collapse. It was not going to last forever. So that's what the application um, can be made from from those verses. Yeah. Okay. Thank and you. The, and, and, the, and the woman and the woman and the woman sitting on the beast again is the concept of of the church in its apostate condition sitting on the beast. And remember, the beast here is representing the the, the, the pagan Roman and, and, and empire, but it is transferring that power to the papacy. And so there's a harmony between the papacy and the, and the, the Roman Empire, and, and, and that's how you get the harmony of the woman sitting on the beast. And, and that's why we're saying that a lot of the pagan Roman practices have come true in 
to the Roman Catholic system because she was in harmony and a lame and a lance um, with that with that be score. Okay, thanks very much. Right, so back back to the practices. So we have transubstantiation. We had um, the, the the mother the mother son um, worship which goes way back, and I'm going to give you a little more detail on that um, tonight when we look at, at the, the tradition of, of Easter and, and Christmas and, and Lent and, and those things that have come true into the church and are, are still with us as practices and traditions, but we're looking at the origin. As I indicated last week, the, the aim of, of going through these and sharing this information with you is, is not to, to point fingers at people's practices because there, there are Christians who, who still incorporate certain um, traditions and beliefs and practices in, into their form of worship and into their, their belief system and, and their religious psyche. And, and so it's not to be condemned and pointing. It is to show, it is show you the origin of them, where, where the, the, the tradition originated and, and, and how it is still connected to us today. That is what I'm showing. You decide when you when you get the information and the evidence of what's connected, so how how you view it, what you think about it, and how you appropriate it to your own um, belief and, and practice. All right. So we, we make it very clear then when we are um, observing the Lord's Supper that we do not believe in transubstantiation. We do not believe that the the, the, the wafer or the bread that we use represents the body, actual physical body, and that the wine represents or, or is the actual blood. They're just symbols and they are used in remembrance of the act that Jesus um, in giving his life and shedding his blood for us. That's that's what it is. It's, it's symbolism and represents that and that's what we believe it is. But the, the, the Roman Catholic Church, because they were connected to, to, to the, the, the pagan um, ideology, they still hold that today. Then we said the concept of having patron saints, a saint for different blessings and, and, and different things that you, you can you can partake of. Like for example, France, France of Assisi was the patron saint of, of animals. And they had different saints of healing and of comfort, and, and that practice was again a tradition that came over from the Roman Empire where they had a series of gods, a series of deities for different things that like you play the god of love and and you have a god of war, you have a god of peace, you have a god of agriculture, you have a god of the sea. For Neptune. So that is a tradition which was influenced by paganism. That's a, that's not, not a, a Christian oriented thing. As I said, you had the mother um Son, goddess, um, fraternity, which was practiced in Babylon, and, and so you you had different names that would have been ascribed to the, the mother goddess relationship, and that came true into the Roman Catholic Church as Mary and, and Jesus, but Mary then would be the mother goddess. And, and that's why the Catholics would, would see in, in a way that, that Mary has some assigned deity that she is like an intercessor and you pray to Mary because that was part of the, the, the pagan tradition which, which came through in, in, into their practice coming from way back in, in Babylon where you had Samaramis who was the, the wife of Nimrod she became the, the mother goddess, and she had a son by the name of Tammuz. And they used to give worship to the mother and the son. And so the Catholics don't just give worship to Jesus. They give worship to the mother as well, because the, the, the pagan belief system was that God was seen as male and female. Whereas in the, in the Jewish traditional system, we see Yahweh as male and we only speak of, of Yahweh. 
So we don't give any credence to Mary. Yes, she was the mother of Jesus. But we don't believe that Mary has any power to intercede um, for us. Um, the God, Jesus, is our intercessor. He's the only intercessor that it is between God and man. And the Bible makes that clear. But that tradition came through from Babylon into Greece and into Rome. You, they, they just had um, different different titles that were ascribed to them according to, 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 to which um, nation you were you were dealing with. Um, I guess we could look at a few of these. Babylon has Samaramis and Tammuz, that's the modern god. Syria had Ishtar and Tammuz, or Astarte, as she would refer to, and we're going to see how this, how this will phase in to, to, the, to the East to practice. Then you have Isis and Osiris in Egypt, Aphrodite and Eros in Greece, Venus and Cupid in Rome, and then Mary and Jesus in the Roman Catholic system. You have a counterpart of a female deity uh, matching your, your, your male deity. And there's, there's even argument now in, in the secular modern world that, that, that we should not have this chauvinistic approach um, as Christians of just referring to God in the masculine, because this is chauvinistic. We, 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 we should, should give recognition to, to the female, and they're even arguing for a change where we use the female title to refer to God in the Bible. That is what people are, are legitimately, um, legitimately arguing that should happen today. But that will carry us right back to what the pagan practice was of having a female deity and the male deity. So, so, so Mary in essence will be the, the Catholic counterpart for the female going right back um, to the, the pagan um, tradition that was, was practiced. And then you had one which I, I think is, is, is the darker side of, of Roman Catholicism. But again, this was a practice which came through from the Roman system, the beast transferring its character um, to, the, to, the, to the papal system, the Roman Empire transferring its belief system of practices and, and the adopted sally into the church. And, and this one is where you had the practice of pederasty. That's P-E-D-E-R-A-S-T-Y. That's the use of, of young boys between like the age of 12 to 14 um, for the emperor's pleasure and, and, and um, to engage in, in, in homosexual activity. And emperors were, were given um, these boys as part of a sort of harem for, for them to have access. So that, that was practiced by the Romans. Homosexuality was very, very prevalent in, 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 the, in the Roman Empire. And, and sadly, this, that same sort of spirit came over in, into um, to, to, to Roman Catholicism. And they are still dealing with, with serious issues in connection with that, more so than in any other church. There have always been I mean, um, serious allegation and, and, and whatnot in relation so sexual abuse of, of priests having um, sexual relationship with, with young boys. As a matter of fact, um, in 2019, Pope Francis had to call or convene a special summit in the Vatican to, to deal with that issue and to discuss how they're going to prevent um, the abuse of, of young boys in the Catholic clergy. And there was a period of time I think between 2001 and 2010, there were about 3,000 um, sexual abuse cases involving priests. And some of them were dating back as far as 50 years. And even just recently, um, there was a call by the UN Human Rights Commission for a more accountability because they believe that the papacy is covering up a lot of, of the practice that has been going on and they're not um, being as accountable as they should be and they're, and they're even calling for compensation for young boys who have been abused in that system of men. Of course, many of them will be adult now, but that's a, that's a practice that came through. Good thing that it is, it is not prevalent throughout the whole of Christendom, but it has been a problem that has, been, has plagued the Catholic Church. That's what one of the darker sides of, of pagan practices because 
that system in, in the Roman Catholic system was a pagan system. Um, sorry, the, the Roman Empire was a pagan system. And, and sadly, that was one of the, of the dark things that, that came true in, in the, in the Roman, Roman Empire. Now, Easter. Now, that's a term we use. And that's a term that we use to, to represent the crucifixion, the, res the resurrection of, of Christ. And the term we use, Easter, has again its origin in, in, a, in a pagan culture. And some of the things that were practiced in, in that system are still part of the church today. Like the Easter egg, and the Easter egg hunt, and the Easter bunny, because these were based on fertility, fertility cults. And you know the bunny or the rabbit is, is one of the most fertile um, of, of animals. Why the Easter egg? That's going back again to the original pagan culture. Nimrod, his wife Semiramis. When Nimrod died, Semiramis took on the title of, of goddess. And she made people believe that Nimrod um, ascended to become a sun god and that he impregnated her with the son that she gave birth to called Tammuz. And so Nimrod was worshipped as the sun god. Semiramis was worshipped as a goddess. Because she says that she was the moon goddess, and it's amazing how, how the, the, the rulers of those times were able to influence the thought patterns and the psyche of the people. You see, as I told you about taking the mark, allowing your mind, your thoughts, your belief systems to be controlled by, by pagan practices and, and belief systems. So she said that she was the moon goddess and that she came down from the moon in this egg that landed in the Euphrates River. That was the belief and that was the culture. So then there was a search for people to find this, this egg that was supposed to have come down in the Euphrates and Samaramis, the, the, the goddess, was born or came out from this egg. And so that's what the, that was the origin of the Easter egg and the, and the hunting for the egg. So in other words, anybody who could find this egg that was supposed to have landed and, and out came this goddess, they will have special blessing and reward. So up to today, we said have the tradition of Easter egg hunt. Why the term? The term Easter is a sort of translation from, from Ishtar, because Samaramis was also called Ishtar. Remember, I told you that these, these pagan deities had different names according to different cultures but it's in Greece, in, in Egypt, in Rome. So she was also referred to as Astarte or Ishtar, or you will see a term in the Bible, Astaroth or Astareth. In the same way that you will see Baal in the Bible connected to Nimrod because he was also referred to as Baal, the sun god. So Samaramis then will be actually teaching the people that she did not have a son by, by natural biological processes. When, when Nimrod ascended and became the sun god, his spirit is what, in, what impregnated her. And so she would have been a virgin in that sense, giving birth to a son, Tammuz. Watch how these, these belief systems are going to link with what we have in, in our Christian practice. And that's why some people say that Christianity copied some of, of the pagan um, belief systems and traditions. And that's how we come up with our, our um, belief systems and practices in, in the world. So they, they just think that, that Mary being the virgin and Jesus being the offspring, that that was just us copying a Babylonian um, tradition and, and, and legend. But no, you see, God would have known 
what they would have been up to and and and, and what would have already been planning the the the, the real McCoy, the, the original, not the counterfeit. And as a matter of fact, what we would argue that it cannot be as copying a tradition is because we have prophecies related to, to Jesus and that he would have been born of a virgin. We have prophecies related in time that Jesus was going to come into the world. So it can't be a tradition. And we copy because these are prophecies that were actually made by people who would have not have seen Jesus, who would not have seen Mary, but the revelation was given to them because this is God's plan. So following through with the, 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 the tradition, they would have been given worship then to Ishtar. And that's how we get the name Easter coming from that. And, and that was a practice which involved a, a, a celebration, giving, giving worship and honor to the goddess Ishtar and the festival and celebration around that is connected to that form of worship. Now, her son Tammuz, again, what the parlors, was supposed to have been killed by a wild boar. He was resurrected 40 days after because she collected the parts of his body and she went into a, a sort of, of, of pagan worship and, and encouraged the people to be engaged in, in fasting for, for 40 days, weeping and fasting for 40 days for the revival of her son. And the legend has it that her son came back to life and that some of the blood that was spilled from is being slaughtered by, by the wild boar fell on a, on a pine tree which sprung back to life. It was a dead pine tree which sprung back to life overnight. And that's how they came to start giving worship to, to, the, pine, to the pine tree. We're going to see how that is, is connected um, to Christmas. So the 40 days of, of, of fasting which comes in Again, the Roman Catholic calendar before Easter would have been a tradition that came from that. Now, I'm going to show you from the Bible that we're not making these things up. So you understand that, that the, the prophets address these issues as well. Um, for example, Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 14. You can probably have your Bible close, we can turn to that. I pick up from, from verse 19. Verse 10, sorry. This is this is God showing Ezekiel what is going on in, 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 the, in the worship. Right. Let's go from verse 9. Ezekiel 8, verse 9. And he said unto me, Go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw and behold every form of creeping thing and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. And there stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. And in the midst of them stood Jazaniah, the son of Shephan, with every man a censer in his hand and a thick cloud of incense went up. Then said he unto me, son of man, thou hast seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark. Every man in the chambers of his imagery. For they say, The Lord saith not, the Lord hath forsaken the earth. He said unto me, Turn thee yet again. Turn thee yet again. 
and thou shalt see greater abominations than they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Sat women weeping for Tammuz. The culture had gotten into Israel. And they were engaged in that same 40 days of weeping for Tammuz, who was killed at age 40 by this well boar. And they were engaged in that. That's, that's, the, that's the origin of, of this Lenten um, season that, that, that has come here. And, and this is, it was an abomination um, for the, for the Lord. So they were engaged in that. So, so you see that, that Tammuz here that we're speaking of is, is, is a real person that we're talking about. And at least in the sense of, of it being practiced as a form of, of worship. We want to turn to another passage, Jeremiah. Chapter 7. We're going to pick up on verse 16. Therefore, pray not thou for this people, neither lift up, pray nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear. Seest thou what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women need dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven. Samaranis will refer to the queen of heaven. That's the same title that the, that the, the Roman Catholic gives to Mary. She is referred to as the queen of heaven. And the poultry offering unto other gods, that they may provoke me to anger. We are seeing from the word that God is not pleased with the traditions and the practices that, that they are adopting because they, they are pagan. Chapter 10. Verse 2. Thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the sign of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with an axe, they deck it with silver and with gold, they fasten it with nails and with hammers, that it move not. They are right as a palm tree, but speak not. They must need be born because they cannot go, but do not be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is any of them to do good. That, that was a practice which, again, also came into the tradition of the Jews of, of cutting down the pine tree and decorating them and bringing them into their homes because that was also part of the celebration that was offered around the Christmas time and we get we get to the Christmas event in recognition of the resurrection of Amus, the son of Samramis, the queen mother of heaven. Because remember I indicated to you that his blood was supposed to have still on the dead pine tree which came to life and, and grew up overnight and became a, a, a large tree. And, and so they, they, they gave worship to the pine tree in recognition of the rebirth of, of, of Tammuz. So remember what we, we said was the practice of the, the Roman Empire to, to try as much as possible to merge their pagan practices with Christianity, and the pagans could still feel comfortable 
and the, and the Christians in a way could be encouraging um, harmony with the pagans. Now, the date for Easter. Now, I, I'm going to ask you this question. Does anybody recognize in terms of timing what normally happens in relation to, to Easter, the timing? Can anybody or anybody has ever given any thought to that that you can reflect on it you now and tell me what you have noticed of Easter? Nothing. Have you noticed that the date, the date for Easter changes? Every year. It's not, it's, it's not a fixed date. It's not a fixed date every year. It changes. Yeah. You know, have you ever given thought and asked yourself why that happens? No. Again, now let's go to the custom. That custom was established way back in, in Babylon, connected to the same Semiramis and Tamils and the worship of, of the goddess and the worship of, of the, the, the pagan um, deity. And what happened at that time was that they set aside the first full moon after the first equinox, the first Sunday after the first full moon, which followed the equinox. So the equinox took place in spring. Um, as spring is the fertility um, season. That's where a lot of, of pagan fertility worship is connected to, um, to, to that time of, of, of the year. And, and so that was established from way back then as the time that they would give the, 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 their, their pagan worship. So it came right into the, the Roman um, Empire and, and, and Constantine. On the, at the Treaty of, of Nicaea, that's in 325 AD, he, has, he established the date for Easter. Now, now, bear in mind that the resurrection, if you go back by the biblical pattern, the resurrection is connected to the Passover. The reason why is because the Passover was the time that Jesus was crucified. If you go back to Exodus chapter 12, you will recognize that the Passover had a fixed date. You can read that for yourself. You're not going to go back to that scripture in the issues of time. You read Exodus chapter 12 and Leviticus chapter 23 and, and establish the festival that, that God himself ordained, which will be Passover. And he said that on the 10th day of the first month, which is, is Abib, we call it Nisan, but that's the Babylonian name. You see, very often once we get accustomed um, to certain um, pagan things is difficult to get them out of our heads, like the three Hebrew boys. If, if you're asked to say who the three Hebrew boys are, you would say Shadrach, Misha, and Abednego. But that's not their original names. It's Hananeh, Mishael, and Azareh. Those are the names that they had back in their, their, their homeland of Judah before they were brought into Babylon um, at the captivity. And then Duke and Azar changed their names to coincide with their pagan deities. Give them Shadrach, Misha, and Benigo, and that's the thing that's stuck in our heads. See, so it happens that way. You see, these things can get all of you. So, so we often refer to that term as, as Nisan, but first month of the, of the year for Israelites who in Abib, and God said on the 10th day you are to select the lamb. You're going to keep that lamb until the 14th day, and then you're going to kill that lamb. Following the 14th day, is going to begin the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is the Feast of the Passover. And the beginning is a Sabbath, and the ending is a Sabbath. So on the 14th day, they're going to kill the lamb, and the Sabbath then is going to follow on the 15th, which is the next day. And you see where the misinterpretation came, this is, this is the Good Friday issue here, where the, where the misinterpret, I remember, we're not, we're not going into details. We, will, we, we can discuss this thing later. I'm just giving you um, the origin of, of things. So the, the origin of that was that, that people just simply thought that when they saw that Jesus was crucified the day before the Sabbath, they 
had to be Friday because their concept was Saturday the Sabbath. So that, that was the, the, the origin of that. So then three days after would be the, the resurrection. So it means then that Good Friday would have had a specific time, what we call Good Friday, but I should say the crucifixion of Jesus would have a specific time, and, and Easter, which we refer to as the resurrection day, we call it Easter, but really truly that, that is a pagan faith. So it should be the resurrection day would, would be fixed. And it would be fixed in connection to the celebration of the Passover, which was a Jewish festival that God told them was to be perpetual from generation to generation, all the while. So how then can we get the changing of the of, of the of the of the time? Because it was established from the pagan culture that came into Rome and Constantine made it official and declared the decree in at the Council of Nicaea in 325 that the first Sunday after the first full moon, following the spring equinox, which is on the, on the 21st of March, because the, the spring equinox begins on the 21st of March geographically, and that was what um, the, the pagans paid attention to. So you see, that's why the Easter is going to be changing all the time, because it, it has to be set to, to that timing. The first Sunday after the, the first full moon, sorry, after the first Sunday, which occurs after um, the first equinox. That's what happened. That's how we, 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 we have that, that um, celebration that's connected um, to that time and has the changing dates. And then the Christmas again goes back to the festivity that was created around the same rebirth of, of, of Tammuz. Now he was supposed to have been born on the 25th of December. And so the tradition of giving worship to Tammuz, the son of Samaranis or Ishtar or Astarte or Astoreth, there's different names. And that's why we got the tradition of, of the 25th, because that came also right down into the practice of, of, of the Roman Empire. And what happened also is that they had a cult practice connected to, to, to that system that that they would go into the temple, the Babylonian temples, and they would engage in sex orgies, and women would just surrender themselves to getting pregnant. And you see, and the timing of it would mean that around the 25th of December, they would be giving birth to baby because they are going to start the same spring time, the same equinox period around March, and nine months after that, what they would do is take those babies and sacrifice them. And then they would take the, the blood from those babies, and this is what the Bible talks about, sacrificing your children. Um, and Baal was also referred to as Molech, which again is connected back to Nimrod. So all of these were pagan practices that came true. And, and that, they were, they were covered the egg with the blood of these babies, and that's where you get the coloration of the eggs and the dandy of these eggs, different colors and whatnot. So the Romans developed a feast of Saturnalia in in connection with the celebration of the pagan deities on the 25th. That, that's what it was about. It had nothing to do with Jesus because this celebration took place even before Jesus was born. And, and so the decoration of the, of the tree, the buying of the gifts, the festivities, the eating and the drinking, all of those things were part of the celebration of that Saturnalia, which was a festival in, in, in honor of the sun god and the worship of, of, of Tammuz who was supposed to have been born on, on the 25th of December. So, so that, that's where it is, it is connected to. That's where our customs and our practices are linked to. It did not originate in Christianity, but I should say in, in the pristine church, in the first century church, they came into being through the apostate church that fed in to the, the paganism and practice it as a means of trying to encourage pagans to become part of their religious um, activity and join the Catholic Church. And, and that's the mistake that was made, rather separating themselves from them because God had told us not to have anything to do with them. And this is the point I'll, I'll, I'll finish before I give you a chance if you want, want to ask any questions. That sometimes we are inclined to think, well, I have a different perspective for or a different belief or a different reason behind the 
practice. I am not pagan. I don't believe what they're believing and doing what they're doing. But we have to watch that because because the um, I missed my thought here. But because the, the, the children of Israel, when they came out of Egypt, they created a bull that came also back from the war time because the bull was an image which represented um, Nimrod and it was used as worship to him and it brought into Egypt. And Egypt also used the bull as a form of worship to get taken deities. Children of Israel came up from Egypt. Moses went up into the mountain for a while. And what happened is that they created a calf and said that this calf is our Yahweh. So they, they say they worship him, they are our, our Nimrod. This calf is our, our Yahweh. We are going to give worship to this calf. 3,000 of them got destroyed because of that. Because God was angry. Because they should not have been creating any image and believing that because they have a good intention that it is worship to God. So we, we have to, to watch that in, in, in all of these, these things. All right, so I break for any questions. So those are just some traditions and the origin of them. That's all I'm dealing with. We could, we could look at these things in, in, in a deeper way, perhaps at, at some other time. But that is just the connection of them, the Lent and the Christmas and the Easter. No question mean that none of these things sound strange to you or they, they, they make you think or well, I, I certainly thinking how you might rain here. Um last week I would have can you hear me clearly? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. So last week I would have uh, before we concluded, I would have asked if it was possible for us to, you know, have this mark and not know it, right? Um, so this week, then I'll be asking, you know, in terms of these practices yes, and the church, uh -huh. um, we, we know that according to the word of God, that it says in the, in the time of ignorance, God wings, right? Right. Um, so once we are no longer ignorant, this information, of, I guess, that has been put before us tonight. Um, I'm just trying to understand oh, how should I really handle it? How should I, how should I deal with it? Because the way I'm saying it, if the church, you know, through, well, true tradition and how we would have come up, you know, being taught, um, we would have also engaged I'll continue to engage in a lot of these practices, probably without knowing the root, you know, of as the way we would have done certain things. Um, can then the church now be guilty of being part or playing its role or, you know, having this relationship with paganism? The church, this would be the contemporary church. Right? That's a very that's a very good question, and that's why I said um, when when we get information, we have to reflect on it, we have to think it through, because again, the Bible warns us about the traditions of men. Paul even spoke in Colossians and told them that we've got to be careful that we do not neglect the rudiments of Christ but follow the traditions of men. What we what we have to realize is that a lot of what we have are traditions of men. Go back originally to the Bible, they're not traditions established in the Bible. Pass over with what established, not Easter and, and the celebration of Easter. Christ was born, yes, but there was no celebration around the birth of Christ. Christ never instructed any celebration, and the first century church never had any celebration. It came out as a practice of Roman Catholicism having adjusted um, to some of the pagan traditions that were, were, were in Rome. 
and, 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 and Jesus spoke the Pharisees and told them that they have neglected to follow him because they give heed to the traditions of men. So what we need to, to understand that we have to watch the traditions of men and where, where they lead us. And if in a way they disconnect us from, from true worship and they, and they connect us, you see, because there's a spirit to these things which may not understand. We, we feel that there's an innocence because, hey, I didn't know Jesus was born. I know it was not only 25th, but in reality, if you read the book of Luke, the book of Luke gives you the time, not the date, but the time when Jesus was born, and he's nowhere near, near the 25th of December. And now you know what that is connected to. So we said, well, hey, I, I know that Jesus was born, so I, I'm saying, no, we, we have to think differently about how we celebrate, and in our, in our mind, what we celebrate. Remember, don't, don't take a mark. Your, your, your thought pattern, your belief system, and your practices have to be oriented towards the mark that Revelation tells us that we should have of God and not of the world and its systems and pagan practices and traditions. So we, we, we yes, we rightfully say we have to rethink some of these things, understand why we do what we do, and if we see the connection, the thing that God, you see, and this is not something I'm saying that that that. We are upset with as a church. God indicated his objection to the practices and he warned the, the Israelites. When you get into these um, pagan lands, do not adopt their practices. Do not follow their customs because they are vain. I abhor them. And if you are doing these things, it's an abomination. There was a passage that even mentioned people praying to God or facing the East. That's, that's a culture of worship we still have people do that another thing what well, that would be connected to in innocence but we got to you know when we we see these things uh, revealed to us and get the truth behind them we got to make adjustments because we could be engaging in paganism and, and violating the very instruction that, that God has given to us so that that's a very um, important thought that you mentioned there when we are exposed to truth we have to act on the truth that's why the Bible says that People are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And that's why it says that we shall know the truth, and the truth shall set us free. We are liberated from things that have us bound um, and attached to when we get to understand um, how God feeds about them, what the origin of them are, and recognize that Satan is in paganism. The war is about a war of worship. So when you see Revelation 12 talk war heaven to worship, Satan was thrown down because he wanted worship. He's come down to earth and, and trying to get the same thing through these systems and through these individuals and through these powers and entities. He wants worship. So we've got to be careful that when we are engaging in these things, that we're not giving Satan what he wants because this is how we've got to worship in, in these pagan cultures. But at the very end of it, Satan is behind all of these um, different deities that are worship. So, right, so Rev? Yes. Yeah, you have two questions. Uh, one from Reverend Sandiford. Um, Stephen Sandiford and yes. the other from Sophia Holder. So Reverend Sandy, you go and then uh, Sister Sophia Holder will be next. Yeah. Uh, um, Reverend Sandy, Reverend just, just on mute. Just on mute, please. And, and you can go ahead. Yes. You're, you're. My one of um, having listened to you tonight, one of my guests was that you seem to be implying that the Catholic Church tolerates, am I right, uh, homosexuality. You know that what, what, what is now happening, if you follow it clearly, the Catholic Church is attacking the present uh, US uh, government over these same issues, pro-life yeah. and um, also homosexuality. They might even, as far as Biden is concerned, he tolerates um, that, that aspect of political scene, tolerates that. I um, mean, accepts that. And that is not going. So I wouldn't like it. Wherever you, the Catholic Church is a bit, I'm not trying to defend it, but what I'm trying to get at, uh, you have to balance, you have to put your facts together. The early church, it was a, a church long time before you came to Constantine. And that was a very, um, emphatic, very dynamic church. You have what is it, um, the patriarchs, they would call them then and so on, right up. It's when um, Constantine came in, 
that he brought in these customs. I heard you say that. So you have to give credit to what was going on before the early church and the Lenten season. I think I may have mentioned this to you. The Lenten season was a season which prepared persons for baptism. If the Catholic Church comes, <laughs> comes they prepared and you had to, we were, we were not going to baptize you. And I'm talking about immerse, by immersion. They were not going to baptize you until you have gone through a sea, whole series of kind of catechism. And I'm right there. So I wouldn't, the, the, these things, we have to balance them and let you know, you have to follow history. History and these things are very, very important. And you can you can't can sidestep them. We talk when Constantine came up with the in 325 with, uh, with Arian um, to combat at that time it was Arianism, as you very well know. Again, he may have put some kind of stamp together because he wanted to keep the empire together. So wherever you have numbers, like in the Catholic Church. They would say to have over uh, uh, 1.3 billion people, however true that is, what I don't know, but they do not, they, they, they're very, very, very anti, um, what you call uh, homosexuality, very, very, but you would have strained priests and you would find homosexuality whether you will find it in all churches and the church has to be very strong against it. I agree with that, but to, to give the um, the Catholic Church being a very big church would have that kind of thing, but certainly don't tolerate that. They'll, they'll expel you. Recently here, as you know, they expelled a man from um, Australia because he was found guilty of having tolerated that kind of system is the thing. So I think we have to be very balanced when we're looking at these things. And when you come to these customs and so on, long time before these customs came in, there was a church which was dynamic. It was a church which stood up over uh, against the um, the witches and the the, the, the onslaughts of the uh, Roman Empire at the time. It, it was it was quite a serious thing. So I, I like to make sure that these things are are balanced. You have you, they, they must be quite balanced. Yeah, but you see, see the point I was trying to, um, to, to connect. Is, is, is the origin of things and why they might be so prevalent within a particular system. I, 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 I agree with what you're saying, and, and it might not be necessarily the, the, the overall position of, of, of the general church in relation to these, these issues or, or some of the traditions, but I was showing where, where the origin of them um, um, was from, where they're connected to, and why it's so prevalent in a particular group. Yes, there's homosexuality, in, 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 the old, in all the churches, and I'm not uh, even looking at the position that the Roman Catholics have no um, homosexuality. What we're looking at is why is it so prevalent in that particular denomination? And I was looking at the connection it had to, to Romanism and the, and the Roman Empire and the practices because the Roman Church came out of that custom and out of those traditions and, and dragged some of those things in into the system. So it's not a, 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 a debate if where they are now. But what were the origin of these things and how they came about in the church? So yes, they were used. Like, have to do with numbers, the where of, you have numbers, yeah. you have problems. Yeah. The, the, the Catholic Church is the largest, um, if you want to call it denomination right now in terms of numbers. Yes. But and therefore and that, when you have that, you would have all these complexities coming through. That that that, that is not true, it's not right, but I'm saying these numbers. So you would have them. The, we, 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 I was remember, and this may sound strange to you. I was in Anderson a few years back away when I used to go up to those conventions. And I remember someone came right up, Dr. Fox at that time was the, um, one of the leading officers of the church, Dr. Fox, Fox who has been here. And he, someone came about a position that the church needs to look at this issue of homosexuality and said that he wanted to have a resolution on it. Well, of course, he struck it down, but he said, it, as I understand it, was a problem. The church of God would have the same problem. So we, we, we are dealing with what? Sin. We are dealing yeah. with problems and human yeah. beings. Right, right, Stephen. You see, we're dealing with the mark. We are, we are dealing with it. With, with, with a, um, an influence 
that that is is sweeping the world and 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 it is resurging and you see and right so the church has to be able not to be drawn into these things but be able to have a stance on them that we are we, we stand opposed to them because we know where our god stands on these issues and that's why it's important that we understand where we should stand and we defend that stand or we could be find ourselves drawn back into a whole lot of paganism because homosexuality is growing in the church why, why should that be the case you see we've got to make sure we don't take the mark you don't follow the image you're dealing with thank you brother stephen for that contribution we will have to spend some 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 time on this but i hope that this can be discussed what some of these issues can be um, discussed in a prolonged pastor's meeting to sort out some of these things. I hope so. Oh yeah, we had, we had a, a, a discussion on homosexuality already, but we were supposed to follow it up. Oh, I, I will talk to you about that privately. <laughs> yeah. All right, so we have, thanks. Thanks, Reverend Sandy. We have um, Sister Sophia and then Randy. Hi, good evening all. Good evening. Um, Hi, so. I just have a comment to make. I agree yes. with what Brother Ryan would have said earlier. I, um, when we look at the word, as Reverend Jackman gave the example of the bull, um, I think it was after that that um, Joshua would have told the persons, um, if you're on God's side, come on this side. If you're on the enemy's side, and then that's how they got killed. I think that's yeah. what happened. Right. So it was a case where, okay, you hear the word of God, you 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 understand what it's saying, and then you have to take action. So as it relates to us practicing these things, and we now see where the origin has where the origin is, I think it is something that we would need to look at urgently because when we look in the old testament, we are not under the law, but when we look in the old testament. And the kings and the nation of Israel heard the book of the law, heard what was written from the book of the law and realized that they were doing something wrong. They quickly made wrong things right, basically. So I think it's something that we would need to look at urgently because we also have our children coming up. And this is something that they would have come up knowing and might continue to believe that it's okay if we don't do something about it. Thank you. Thank you too. Yeah, but of course, those are the things that you know we, we have to discuss um, as leaders. I didn't even get into the talk about Santa Claus yet, the origin of that, and that is being fed into the mind of our children a lot too. Right? So those are things, yeah, we definitely have to give a lot more thought um, to them and don't treat them as superficial matters. All right, Brother Randy. Yes, good night, Reverend Jackman. I just wanted yes. to. So in the early church, yeah. I read that I read that the highest or the highest order in the early church was a bishop. And then in history, Paul told Timothy, be careful, beware. False mm -hmm. prophets will enter the church. Yes. And then we saw they went from bishops to archbishop, archdeacons, to, and then it went on to popes. Now my my question is this is that would you when we go from the bishops and then we have our bishops and different titles would you call that an order of the papal system it it seems that they had more more divisions in, in the hierarchy um, the other church groups. But I, I, I do not know if it's a system um, that we can only identify um, with them. But, you know, they had cardinals, they had bishops, they had monks, they had... Right, they, they, they have a, a whole lot of different divisions in their system. So I, I think they, they perhaps have the highest amount of order. And, and you rightfully say, the early church, they have these amount of divisions. You're a pastor, you're a bishop if you have the oversight of, of a number of churches. I'm, I'm busy. Um, we, didn't, we didn't have a, a lot of those 
um, the, the vision, you were a deacon um, or a deaconess. But you have you have always had divisions in, in, in the churches, but to the larger degree, I think the Roman Catholic system that had most of them. But in, in the first century church, where you had deacons, you had deaconess, you had pastor, you had bishop. But a lot of the other titles have been introduced um, right, to, to that, that system. A uh, question, would reverend be one of those titles? Pardon me? Would reverend be one of those titles? Yeah, rev reverend is one of the titles that we would have introduced. Because we, we, don't, we don't see that terminology uh, used in... I, I guess that's, that's a, a title given more so because of, at any day a reverend uh, is still a pastor. But it is an official title designated because um, associated to that you no know, the right to perform marriages and things of that nature. So it more comes as an official um, position. That's why some people say they rather prefer to be called a pastor because it's not a biblical title. It's a it's a it's a man-made um, title. That that's the truth. You have to admit that. And, and some people argue that, that the term reverence should be connected really to God and not to man. So we, we should have even given thought to, to, to something of that nature. You see, but as I say, these are things very often we don't deeply reflect on and we don't think about them and we move away and adjust to traditions. When we look back in the Bible, we wouldn't see anybody being addressed as a leader as, as a reverend. So sometimes it might be that we should keep, keep things simple and, 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 and go where the word goes. As Vincent James said, he used to say, Remain silent where the Bible is silent and speak where the Bible speaks. I know if you old enough to remember they said Jim was there. All right, but Jeff, it seemed like those are all the questions. They were very good. Yes, sir. And the next and the next session, all right, we could we could pick up. Um, on, as I say, these are just was just as this sketch I gave you. These are things that you know, know ourselves as as, as we, could, we could discuss in more detail, or even engage our churches uh, in them in, in a more tangible way. But this was just to show where the, the links were and how they were connected. Uh, paganism, but if we're looking now to start, that's another interesting area: the, the, the kingdom of God. That's that's a very important area.